from Nashville, Tennessee. This is the day the Lord has made. Join us for the next 30 minutes as we share the gospel ministry of Dale and Jerry Robbins.
When I became a born-again Christian decades ago, the Lord really did a number in my life, changing and transforming me in ways I never could have imagined. A lot even happened right away, even after the first uh, few minutes and hours after I gave my heart to the Lord. It was just like the Bible describes. Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But while there was a big change in me, uh, practically overnight, this rebirth was just the beginning of a long lifetime of growing and maturing as a follower of Christ, which continues to this day. I'm still a work under construction. I'm far from perfect, but by God's grace, I've come a long way from those early days where I struggled to overcome a lot of the old sins and inclinations of the past. Like a newborn baby, I had an intense desire to grow and learn each day that I opened the Bible. It was like a, a whole new, exciting discovery of things I'd never knew before. And while I was amazed at the many truths and teachings of, of our Lord, I was also surprised by how many references I saw in the Bible about the devil who was also called Satan, Lucifer, the tempter, our adversary, the thief, and, and others, who apparently continued to cause trouble and havoc in the lives of early believers who followed Jesus. Even though I attended church as a kid and would always hear about God, I can't remember hearing much about the devil and wasn't even really sure that he was supposed to be real until one brief visit by a missionary couple who came to speak one Sunday at our little country Methodist church. The couple were from Africa, where they had been ministering the gospel to primitive tribes of people. I was probably around 10 or 11 at the time, and I was surprised to hear them talk a lot about the devil and demons as though they were real. They spoke about the many problems and challenges the devil brought against their ministry there, and even about demon-possessed people whom they would pray for to be healed and delivered. And I'll never forget how the missionary's wife described a tribal witch who caused them problems and would cast spells on people <laughs> to intimidate the missionaries and demonstrate uh, her power. The witch cut her own arms with broken glass. Then while the wounds were still dripping blood, they dried up and disappeared as though nothing had happened. But despite this and many other challenges, somehow the missionaries were still making progress. Something that I, I didn't understand. I didn't understand any of this stuff. I don't know how this talk affected the other people in our church at that time, but it sure freaked me out as I had never heard anything like this before. I always thought when the preacher talked about the devil, it was just a symbol of evil, not really a person or a thing. But it appeared that these missionaries were telling something that was true and real, which left me with a lot of questions. For instance, was the devil only in Africa, but not any place else? I, I didn't know. Or was it possible that the devil was also roaming about here in America too? And then I thought of criminals who had committed horrible murders whom everybody believed to be insane. Was it possible they were really demon-possessed and not crazy? These thoughts were troubling, but eventually faded after a while and uh, until I eventually gave my, my heart to the Lord later as an adult and, and began to follow Him. Shortly after that, when I was saved, I was uh, doing my best to overcome a variety of my own temptations and and issues from the past when I stumbled across an old paperback stored in a cabinet of books that belonged to my mom. The name of the book was called Dealing with the Devil by C.S. Lovett. It brought back my earlier memory of the missionaries who also dealt with the devil and since I thought he was causing me some trouble too, I thought maybe it was something I ought to read. Other than the Bible, I hadn't read any other Christian books, but it became obvious that God arranged for me to stumble across that very helpful paperback, which as I began to read, opened my eyes to the reality 
of Satan, whom it appeared had caused me a great deal of problems all through my life. I was amazed by what I learned and by what the Bible taught me about how to overcome him. First, it's helpful to understand when we refer to the devil, we're not just talking about a symbol of evil or, or a cartoon character with horns and a pitchfork, as I thought as a kid. But he's a real person called Satan, but which also can refer to his many other agents that we refer to as demons or devils, plural, all of whom share his same evil characteristics. According to the Bible, Satan's origin dates back eons ago in heaven where he was originally one of the three archangels called Lucifer but was cast out of heaven to the earth when he and his angels rebelled against God Almighty. That's described in Isaiah chapter 14. that says Lucifer was cast down to the earth where he remains today unlike the myths that place him standing in the flames of hell with his pitchfork. Someday in the future, Satan will be cast into the lake of fire along with his demons, as well as all those who reject God's mercy and grace. But for now, Satan is among us here on the earth. The whole reason why we must understand something about him and how to deal with him and his spiritual forces. For this reason, the Apostle Paul wrote in his first epistle, Stay alert! Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8. It was quite a surprise when I first read this passage because I didn't even know I had an enemy. Yet I could see how this adversary had been at work long before I was a Christian, trying to destroy me before I could ever get to the point that I would receive Christ. And that, of course, is what defines his personality. He is a destroyer, a killer, an adversary to God and to each of his followers. The personification of all that's evil and the author of every despicable evil work. But imagine such an enemy who never sleeps, is unseen by the natural eye, and equipped with supernatural powers whose only desire is to steal, kill, and destroy as Jesus described in John 10.10, 10, on the prowl around the clock seeking to cause mayhem and destruction to all believers and the work of Christ throughout the world. With ruthless hostility, he searches for the weaknesses in our faith and spiritual lives, hoping, if he can, to devour us with deception, which is his biggest tool or temptation or oppression. Regardless of whether you realize it or not, Satan has targeted you as a victim. He knows your name, your address, your strengths and weaknesses, and somewhere in the shadows he and his forces lurk, waiting, planning for some moment they will strike when you're caught off guard. He desperately hopes that you, as well as many other Christians, remain ignorant of his reality. So. You'll blame his assault on somebody or something else. The devil's method of operation is almost always undercover. He subtly manipulates hindering circumstances and inspires evil thoughts or temptations, disguising his activities behind the shroud of people or things. He can't make you sin, but he will try to tempt you and uh, appeal to you that you will. Uh, follow the impulses of your, uh, of your flesh. He will always seek to divert attention and blame for his actions on others. But make mo no mistake, he is your real enemy. Not your husband, your wife, your employer, not the government, or your Christian brothers and sisters. As Paul wrote, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Ephesians 6 and verse 12. The good news, however, is that although the devil is described like a roaring lion, in reality, he's not. He, he has no actual authority over believers. Those who have put their faith in Christ, who are following him, 
the devil is not really a lion, but roars like a, a lion to bluff his victims into fear and intimidation. He, he is a liar and a deceiver and uses deception as his weapon to gain advantage over those who are ignorant of the limitations of his power. The whole reason why we have to have these discussions and, and talk about his reality. When Jesus gave his life on the cross as the sacrifice for the sins of the world, he also redeemed us from Satan's power and dominion over us. As scripture says, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2 and verse 15. And for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Praise God! Satan is r really already a defeated enemy. His legal authority was neutralized by the finished work of Christ on the cross. But, but you might say, if Satan is already defeated, why then is he still causing us trouble here? Well, because even though Christ's power broke Satan's legal authority, the Lord has left it up to us to enforce the devil's defeated condition. Just like a, a court may pass a judgment it's up to the law enforcement officers to enforce those, those laws and to, to arrest those who uh, are in, not in compliance to the, uh, the laws. It may come as a surprise to many, but every believer has authority over the devil and uh, has the authority to arrest him and to put him in his place. But, but we have to use our authority as Christians that he has, put, he has given us to put Satan in his place. As a believer, you need not fear Satan or what we're talking about here today except to realize that uh, the authority that God has given you over the devil is yours. Every person whose name has been written in the Lamb's Book of Life, all those who are saved, have been given authority over the devil as Jesus said, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10 and verse 19, which Jesus spoke to his uh, uh, disciples and followers uh, that were in, engaged in ministry. You have the right to use the authority of the name of Jesus to repel and drive Satan out of your territory and to break his grip over spiritual strongholds. As the Bible says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5. When you recognize Satan's activity and covert operations, take authority over him in the name of Jesus, just as, as Jesus did himself and the early apostles did. Tell the devil to, to leave, to get. I rebuke you, Satan. I, I do that many times. Jesus, in fact, said this would be one of the signs of his followers. These signs will follow them who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, Mark 16, verse 17. The devil and his demon forces hate the name of Jesus and detest any atmosphere of praise and worship which exalts the name of Jesus. Christ said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them, Matthew 18, 20. Praise God. And be assured the presence of Christ will expel the presence of Satan when we lift up Jesus and when we talk about him. Now, now you see, uh, many churches sometimes get to talking about the devil and they'll just keep talking. And we really need to lift up Jesus, who is the one who repels the devil. Don't give the devil a lot of attention. We need to be aware as we're teaching today and talking about the enemy 
but really the focus of what we need to be talking about and lifting up is Jesus, you see, who gives us power and authority over the devil and who causes the devil to run when we lift up his name. Lifting up Jesus in praise sends the devil running. So, how do you slam the door on the devil? Well, the name of Jesus will drive Satan away, but it would be futile to order Satan's departure if we open the door and leave it that way for him to flourish, right? The Bible tells us not to give place for the devil in Ephesians 4.27. That is, provide no area of your life where Satan can be comfortable or establish strongholds. You see, that's originally how the door got open that gave him the chance to stick his foot in the door. Someone may have done something offensive and we harbored a grudge instead of forgiving and moving on. And Satan used that to multiply more offenses and a bitter attitude. Or as we were browsing the web, we came across filthy images, something that virtually every person will stumble across sooner or later in these days. But instead of quickly moving on, we hesitated and gave our time and our attention to view and absorb that stuff until the lust consumed us and kept demanding more. The devil's objective is to appeal to our fleshly senses and impulses and can always be found working in those who entertain sin, disobedience, rebellion, or a self-willed nature. Unforgiveness toward others is especially a hot spot in which Satan flourishes, as Paul described in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11. Furthermore, any area of your life that is not submitted to God becomes open territory for the devil, and he will claim a right to bring his expanding influences to those areas. This is why the scripture says, Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. In James 4 and verse 7. That's how you resist the devil. Listen. That's how you resist the devil, is by submitting yourself to God. God increases, and we begin to uh, see the devil pulling back and repelling from the fact that Jesus is having his way in our life. The only way to resist Satan is really to submit yourself to God. And this is what Jesus was referring to when he said, the ruler of this world is coming and has nothing in me. In John 14, 30, Jesus was saying he had submitted himself to the Heavenly Father, to God Almighty, and although the devil would try him and give him trouble, there was nothing for the devil to use to gain a foothold in his life. This effectively slams the door on the devil. Who will withdraw? At least for a while, for a time. But be aware, he'll be back again and again trying to get a, a foot in the door of your life. He will continue coming back and knocking and you will need to repeat this formula again and again. So stay on alert, don't be taken by surprise, but preempt Satan's temptations by keeping your focus on God and His Word so the door remains closed to the devil and stay prayed up. Now that's an old term that I used to hear my pastors talk about years ago. That means to be uh, uh, on your knees before the Lord every day and consistently uh, being filled with uh, attention upon God and spiritual things. So stay prayed up and filled with God's Spirit every day so that you're ready for whatever comes your way, whenever that comes. It, it will probably come at a time you're not expecting the enemy to give you a hard time, as it has with me. And remember this, so very important, God's Spirit is in the heart of every believer and has given you power and authority over the devil. And by submitting to God and exercising your rightful authority in the name of Jesus, you're more powerful than the enemy. As, the, as he said, he who is in you, as John said, is greater than he who is in the world. 1 John 4 and verse 4. My friend, Brother and sister in Christ, you are a powerful entity, more powerful than you realize. Jesus is in you, 
And I've heard some people say that Satan is the second most powerful entity in the universe, but that is not true. You are. You and Jesus are more powerful than the devil. And he fears you. But most of all, he fears that you will understand that you have authority over him and that you can uh, kick him out of your life and move on with Jesus. Well, let's pray today. If the devil has been giving you a hard time, just tell him, get out of my life, Satan. Get out. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Sometimes thoughts have come into my mind that I think that are inspired of Satan, just like they did with with Peter and others in, in the New Testament. Get out of my thoughts in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you, I repel you. And focus your attention on Christ, His Word, the things of God. And the devil, he'll uh, slink away. He doesn't want to be a part of that. But let's pray today. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus, if the enemy has been given a hard time to many of my friends, we take the authority of the name of Jesus and we say, get out. We rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. We repel you in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, cause my brothers and sisters to fill themselves with your word, with prayer, and the things of God that will make them strong on you, that will further repel Satan from wanting to be a part of any of that. And we know, Lord, the devil's going to come back and try to harass us and, and give us a hard time again. But help us to stay on our knees that we will continue submitting our hearts and our lives to you, Lord, that you can keep us full of your presence. Lord, bring healing, bring strength to each one that are struggling. Provide for those who are dealing with difficulties in their life. And Lord, we pray that you will strengthen them through your word. Let them spend time in prayer and in the things of God, that they will be strong in you and in the power of your might to overcome whatever obstacles come their way. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, folks, we love you today, and we hope that uh, you'll be back with us next week. Same time, same place. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. For more information, please visit our website at victorious.org. Until next time, God bless you.